Good morning from Thessaloniki, Greece. It is 8.30 here on this Friday morning. A lot of rain last night, and it is a bit overcast, a little bit cloudy. But that's all right, because we've got a lot of news to talk about. So I am here at Aristotle Square, Aristotelus Square, here in the uh, what is considered to be the, the main center of, uh, of Thessaloniki. Obviously, it is not the center center because you have the, the port over there. You have the, the main city right up there. If you look through the buildings, a lot of pigeons hanging around as well. They're just chilling out. And uh, let's talk about the news. Let's discuss what's going on in the world. The big story yesterday was the, uh, the sentencing of the three foreign fighters, prisoners of war, if you go by what Liz Truss, the foreign secretary of the UK, is stating, or mercenaries, if you go by, uh, by the sentencing from the uh, DPR, from the Donetsk Supreme Court. And they have sentenced two British nationals, uh, Aidan Iceland, Aidan Iceland, and uh, Sean Piner, Sean Pinner, or Piner, and uh, one Moroccan national, by the name of uh, Ibrahim, I believe. So, um, Iceland, Piner, and Ibrahim. And they have been sentenced to, uh, to death by the uh, Donetsk court. Now, a death sentence is uh, death by firing squad, according to the, uh, the laws of the uh, Donetsk People's Republic. This has already been appealed. So they uh, had the right to appeal this decision and they are going to appeal it. And the court basically found them guilty of, uh, of being mercenaries, pretty much. I mean, that was, uh, that was the sentencing. That was the, the main uh, reason for them being given the death penalty. And uh, we've already, actually before the sentencing, we had uh, the one British uh, fighter mercenary um, is, is it Iceland Aiden or Aiden Iceland? I, I always mix up the two, but uh, let me see actually, because I always uh, jumble the, the order. Anyway, he was, um, the order of his name, he was, he gave an interview actually, right before the sentencing. And uh, he said that he was duped. Aiden Aslan, Aiden Aslan. I apologize for that. He said that he was a pawn, that's a direct quote in a political game, and that he was duped into uh, fighting for the, uh, for the Ukraine military. And uh, he said that uh, he was actually pro Donbass in 2014. And then he said, and I quote, my views started to change after I started seeing media reports and stuff that was basically saying that it was not locals, but the Russian soldiers that were doing everything in Donbass. So this guy was in Syria fighting and then he uh, went to Ukraine. I believe he was actually with the Ukraine military for something like three, four years, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he got caught. He has, a, he has a YouTube channel, which is interesting. I think he's put up like three, four videos on that channel as well. And uh, now he's been sentenced to death. That is on appeal and um, we'll wait and see what the next steps are. Liz Truss uh, came out with a statement, the foreign secretary, foreign minister of the UK, and she said, I utterly condemn the sentencing of Aidan Aslin and Sean Piner, or Pinner, uh, held by Russian proxies in Eastern Ukraine. They are prisoners of war. This is a sham judgment with absolutely no legitimacy. My thoughts are with the families. We continue to do everything we can to support them. Now, Take a look at, uh, keep an eye out as to what happens with the Moroccan national and then keep an eye out uh, how the, the appeals go for the two British uh, nationals. I'm very curious to see if there's going to be any differences as to uh, the appeal judgments or how the Moroccan national is handled in contrast with the British nationals because uh, Morocco, I don't think Morocco is really taking a position with regards to this conflict. So I'm interested to see how uh, the Donetsk authorities or the courts handle the Moroccan officials or to see if diplomacy actually works to get uh, Ibrahim 
out of this uh, situation. And then I'm curious to see what uh, diplomacy is used by the UK in order, if it's even possible, to, uh, to get uh, Piner and uh, Aiden Aslin out of this situation. And I say if diplomacy is, is possible because unlike Morocco, um, the, the UK, the Boris Johnson government, has been uh, the most aggressive, the most bellicose towards, uh, towards Russia and towards the Donbass. They're the ones that talked Zelensky out of agreeing to a ceasefire in March. It's been the Boris Johnson government that has uh, escalated this conflict, that has poured money and weapons into uh, Ukraine. It is the Boris Johnson government that has ridiculed and demonized Russia and uh, the government of Vladimir Putin. So all of this uh, lack of diplomacy from the UK and all of the bellicose aggressive rhetoric coming from the Boris Johnson government is not going to help, in my opinion, is not going to help uh, Piner and Aslin. And Liz Truss, well, Liz Truss was the one that... Uh, three months ago when the, the conflict started, she was the one that was actually encouraging British uh, nationals to go to Ukraine and fight. She actually made statements. I'm not saying she's the one to blame for what's happening to uh, these two British nationals, but she is on record and she did make statements where she was telling British nationals that it's cool to go to Ukraine and fight and to help the uh, the Alensky regime and the Ukraine military fight for their freedom against the invading Russian forces. So she actually did encourage this type of behavior from uh, these two British nationals. And uh, now she's coming out with a statement saying this is a sham trial and she is shocked by this judgment. I'll defer to Alexander or to Robert Barnes as far as um, whether the Geneva Conventions do cover mercenaries. That I, uh, I don't know, but I've heard arguments for or against with, uh, with regards to uh, the Geneva Conventions and if they cover mercenaries. But um, Liz Truss doesn't categorize these two British nationals as mercenaries. She actually says they are prisoners of war. Really? Liz Truss. If that's the case, then is the UK at war with Russia? Are they at war with uh, the Donetsk People's Republic? Because uh, last I checked, the, uh, the UK has not declared war on Russia or on the, uh, the Donbass. So the fact that she's saying that these two British nationals are prisoners of war is, uh, is really interesting. Anyway, let's uh, shift gears now and let's talk about, since we're talking about the war, let's talk about the latest statements from the Russian Defense Minister, Sergei Shoigu, who came out with a statement saying that uh, the land bridge from uh, Russia to Crimea on the Southern Corridor is now complete. And why is this important? Well, we did a video on the Duran, the... Uh, last night actually last night and uh, alexander makes a great point that this land bridge that shoigu is talking about is something that many many in the media have not really uh, grabbed onto but it's really important because not only did shoigu say that the land bridge was complete but that the russian military has pretty much restored much of the transportation infrastructure that was uh that was ruined or that was damaged in the conflict so that now the Russian military from Russia and Crimea all the way to uh, Kherson and, and Zaporozhye, they can now transport all of, their, uh, all of their weapons to those areas via rail. And this is huge because this is another further indication that Phase three, the next front in uh, this conflict, in this special military operation, may well be Odessa, Nikolaev, Odessa, because now the Russian military can get all their, uh, all their weapons and everything they need in place in the Kherson region 
to uh, make a move on Odessa and eventually link up with Transnistria. We already know that uh, the, Ale the uh, <laughs> I was going to say the Zelensky regime, we already know that the Alensky regime is, uh, is nervous about what's going to come in Odessa. That is why they don't want to demine the, uh, the port right outside of Odessa because they're afraid of, uh, of the Russians moving, uh, making a move on Odessa via sea. So they want to keep those mines in place. And that is the reason for this grain wheat uh, shortage slash Russian naval blockade excuse. The reality is that uh, the Aletsky regime does not want to demine the area outside of Odessa, the, the, uh, the maritime area outside of Odessa, because they may know that uh, Russia's next move is going to be made at uh, Odessa. And we also have news that the Russians have um, fortified Snake Island. Actually, I hear they put S, I think S-400s now on Snake Island. I could be wrong there, but uh, I have heard that the Russians are, uh, are fortifying Snake Island because that's going to be an important uh, staging area, an important part of what will eventually be a play um, against Odessa. So... Stage three is looking like it's going to be made in, uh, in the Nikolaev Odessa Southern Corridor in order to completely landlock Ukraine and to link up with Transnistria. I'm not saying this is a definite, but if you go off of what Shoigu said with regards to the land bridge and to the fact that they've repaired the infrastructure and the railway links, if you go off of the fears of the uh, Elensky regime with the demining, and if you look at the, uh, the military buildup, the fortification of Snake Island, then all signs are pointing to something taking place in what, uh, what is the, the only part of the, uh, of the coastline which is not under Russian control. So with that being said, we actually do have uh, the Ukraine defense minister who has said that they have now uh, put in place these Harpoon uh, anti-ship missiles and Neptune anti-ship missiles and they're in place and ready to defend the, uh, the coastline uh, in and around Odessa. So that is coming from the Ukraine defense minister and uh, his statements, another signal that Odessa is going to be phase three. I'm not saying it's a definite, but uh, that's what it looks like. So let's shift gears now. And since we're talking about Neptune anti-ship weapons, which were Harpoon, sorry, the Neptune ones are the Ukrainian anti-ship, the Harpoon uh, anti-ship uh, weapons that were given to Ukraine. Let's talk about weapons that are not going to be given to Ukraine from Bulgaria and Greece. So Bulgaria, by the way, Duran shop, 10% off, use the code good day. Bulgarian uh, Prime Minister Petkov has come out with a statement saying that uh, Bulgaria is tapped out. They have no more weapons to give. And uh, he came out with a statement the other day and said that uh, Bulgaria still stands by Ukraine. They will still support Ukraine. They've complied with all of the EU sanctions. But as far as weapons go, enough is enough. So Bulgaria, it looks like they are tapping out and they're not going to be providing more weapons to Ukraine. The Greek defense minister also came out with a statement like two days ago. And uh, he said that outside of this German-Greece tank swap that they're putting in place, which is really just another way to hide corruption. That's all that's happening when they talk about swapping weapons and then taking what's what you have in the swap and sending the old stuff to uh ukraine and all of these very complicated schemes are just a way to uh to hide corruption that's all it is weapon mic military industrial complex corruption but anyway the uh, greek defense minister said that outside of this tank swap with germany greece is also tapping out of uh the weapons business with ukraine and Greece has said that they're facing a lot of challenges from, uh, from Turkey. And Turkey is now threatening Greece. 
and they're going to need the weapons, including S-300s that I believe the Greek military has in Crete. Someone in Greece, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Greece does have S-300s that are in Crete. And uh, Alensky has been asking for those weapons. He has been pressing the Greek government to give him the, uh, the S-300s. And I could be wrong, S-300s or S-400s in Crete. And uh, the Greek defense minister said, no way, we are going to need all of these weapons because we are facing a threat from Turkey. So Greece has said that they're tapping out from the weapons game with Ukraine, not to mention the fact that uh, the Mitsotakis government giving weapons to, uh, to Alensky is very, very unpopular in Greece. Like very, very unpopular in a big, big way. So um, Greece is out of the game. I've talked about how Germany has been trying to come up with excuses to not send Ukraine weapons. They came up with the excuse from Der Spiegel that if they send the really uh, good, highly effective German weapons to uh, Alensky, that he's going to use those weapons to, uh, to invade Russia and, and all of these little excuses that uh, the German media and Olaf Scholz are trying to come up with so that uh, they can... They could find a, a way to, to, to let the Alensky regime down easy with regards to sending weapons to, uh, to Ukraine. So they're coming up with these fantastical excuses. The bottom line is Germany is also looking to get out of, uh, of the weapons gig with Ukraine. So Bulgaria, Greece and Germany, they are signaling that there are going to be no more weapons sent to Ukraine. And this actually is connected to my clown world. I've got a lot of clown worlds that I could do, but I think today I'll do two clown worlds. Yeah, I'll do two clown worlds for uh, for today. So um, outside of uh, of the weapons story with Greece and Bulgaria, do I have anything else that I want to talk about? Yes, one more story before I get into the two clown worlds. And this story comes out of Poland and it's connected to Germany. And we have the uh, Polish deputy prime minister, Mr. Kaczynski, who is actually the man that is running Poland. He's kind of the guy behind the curtain and he's the real uh, decision maker in Poland. Anyway, he has come out and uh, he has said that uh, it is not Russia. It's not only Russia that is a threat to Poland, but it is Germany that is a threat to Poland. Kaczynski is really losing it. He, I think the hysteria is really getting to him and he's starting to uh, to lose his mind. That's that's just my own personal <laughs> belief, but it seems like the guy's really, really out of touch with, uh, with reality and this whole Ukraine-Russia thing is getting to him. Anyway, he said, I don't know if Germany wants to arm itself against Russia or against us. This is according to Deputy Prime Minister Yaroslav Kaczynski. He, um, he is the, the leader of the ruling party, the Law and Justice Party, and on Wednesday, he suggested that Germany's remilitarization may threaten his country as well as Russia threatening Poland. Kaczynski, one of Europe's most anti-Moscow officials, nevertheless celebrated Germany's reversal of decades of pacifism. Quote, when we said that we would be seriously arming ourselves the Germans immediately announced that they would too, Kaczynski told supporters in a speech on Wednesday, quote, whether the Germans want to arm themselves against Russia or against us, I don't know, but at least they are arming themselves. <laughs> Does this sound like a statement coming out of someone who's, who's, uh, <laughs> who's altogether up there? It does not sound like that to me. It sounds like, like Kaczynski is, he, he needs to, uh, to retire he needs to take a break and and just relax a bit because um he, he, it seems he's getting paranoid anyway that's the statement coming out of the real leader of poland Yanoslav kaczynski and now let's get to our clown world by the way on a side note the pentagon has come out with some statements with regards to the bio labs and uh, they have said that they are indeed running biolabs in Ukraine, 46 of them, not 28 or 26 like the Russian Ministry of Defense has claimed, but 46 biolabs. And they've said that these biolabs in uh, Ukraine are being used for peaceful public health purposes, a peaceful public health 
project and uh, the Pentagon and the US military, they're accusing Russia and China of spreading disinformation and sowing mistrust about its efforts to rid the world of weapons of mass destruction. That is a statement coming out of the uh, Department of Defense with regard to the bio labs. 46 peaceful Ukrainian laboratories, health facilities, and disease diagnostic sites over the last two decades have been operating in uh, Ukraine, according to the uh, Pentagon. So these programs have focused on, and I quote, improving public health and agricultural safety measures at the nexus of non-proliferation. So these 46 biolabs in Ukraine are really um, for, uh, for peace, everybody, for peace, for health, and to, uh, to prevent um, a nuclear uh, a nuclear crisis, a nuclear conflict for non-proliferation, as the uh, as the Department of Defense states. So, yeah, no, nothing to worry about, everybody. These uh, these forty six bio labs <laughs> these are bio labs for good, not bio labs for uh, bad. <laughs> so let's get to our clown world. The first clown world is a quick one, and it has to do with uh, the Russian pranksters who go by the name of, uh, what is it? Lexis and um, Vovan. Lexis and Vovan. And these Russian prankster, pranksters, I believe like last week or two weeks ago, they uh, prank called former US President George W. Bush. <laughs> and uh, they completely punked. Remember that show, Punked, with Ashton Kuch Kuchner? Kuchner? Yeah, they completely punked uh, George W. Bush. And it's really interesting how, like, when all of these elite leaders, they hear, like, a Russian accent, their mind automatically defaults to, this is either a call from Vladimir Putin or from someone in the Kremlin or uh, from uh, Elensky. It's like every Russian accent to them is Putin or someone in and around Putin <laughs> or Zelensky or something like that, which just goes to show that they know nothing about uh, Russia and uh, and they've really they really have this stereotype of Russia, which is a really bigoted stereotype. But this, this has been ingrained in their uh, in their being in, in 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 their mindset, and uh, it just goes to show that they've never spoken to, to a normal everyday Russian person because everyone that calls them with a Russian accent is Putin or someone that knows Putin or someone that loves Putin or is against Putin. I mean, every, their entire existence of Russia, everything they know about Russia centers around this one figure, Vladimir Putin. Anyway, uh, the Russian pranksters, Vovan and Lexis, have, have had their channel on YouTube deleted. This was actually their backup channel, and this channel has now been deleted. And the pranksters believe, it has not been stated by YouTube, but they believe that this deletion was due to the, to the prank that they... Uh, <laughs> that they committed, that they made against uh, George W. Bush. Uh, Bush was not exactly the sharpest knife in the in the drawer, but boy, did they uh, did they prank him? Did they punk him really, really good? I'm trying to see some of the the stuff that they got Bush to say. <laughs> yeah, Bush was saying all kinds of stuff like. Uh, yeah, Bush told the, uh, the fake Alensky that Ukraine's mission is to destroy as many Russian troops as you can. That's a direct quote. And Bush suggested that a military victory over Russia would see many of Ukraine's issues go off the table. Bush also revealed that during his time in office, he felt that Ukraine needed to be in the EU and NATO while keeping Russia on the fringe of the military bloc, adding that it doesn't really matter what Russia was promised in regards to NATO expansion. <laughs> so, so that was George W. Bush saying all kinds of stupid things, which is really in character with George W. Bush because he was he was an idiot. <laughs> and anyway, they've had their YouTube channel now uh, now deleted. Their backup channel has now been deleted. And now let's get to our final clown world in this two clown world special, and it has to do with uh, we talked about weapons with Bulgaria, Greece, Germany. This has to do with weapons and uh, the United States and javelins and stingers, which, uh, which the US now is saying that they don't have any more of to send to Ukraine. 
So the U.S. military is warning the Biden White House that uh, they have no more Javelin missiles to send to Ukraine. They have no more Stinger missiles to, uh, to send to Ukraine. And if they are going to send more of these weapons, well, then they're going to have to tap into the U.S.'s own reserves and their own inventory that, uh, that they just don't want to do in order to send them to, uh, to Ukraine. The, the Department of Defense has actually said that they've sent 7,000, to date, 7,000 javelins to Ukraine, of which those 7,000 have either been destroyed or have been taken and confiscated by the Russian military and the Donbass military. And uh, they can't produce more stingers because of supply chain issues. So they're pretty much tapped out with regards to javelins and, uh, and to stingers. And this actually is an interesting story and it's an inter interesting clown world because for three months, all we have heard from the collective West is that in the next week or in the next 10 days, Russia will be out of missiles, they'll be out of ammunition and the war will have to uh, end. And this is what we've been hearing every other week. The Russians are running out of missiles. The Russians are running out of ammo. The Russians are running out of weapons. The war is gonna uh, come to a grinding halt because the Russians have no more weapons in their inventory. And this is what we've been hearing for three months. The reality of the situation is that in three months, the Russian military has been able to deplete the inventories of Greece, Bulgaria, Germany, and even the United States of America. That is the reality of the situation. And so no more javelins to uh, Ukraine, no more stingers to Ukraine. The US military is saying, we are tapped out of these weapons. And in the end of the day, it is the collective West that is also being demilitarized along with Ukraine. And that is the, the, the truth of this, uh, of this military weapons fiction that we've been hearing from the collective West for the last three months. It is actually not the Russians, but the collective West that is running out of weapons. Anyway, I am going to end this video right here in front of the statue of Aristotle. You can see it right behind me. I will take you in for a closer look. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out the Durant's channel and go to the Durant.locals.com. For anyone that loves Greek history and that loves philosophy, this is a beautiful statue of Aristotle. We are shooting this video on his square. This is his square right here. Let me just show you the writing so you can make that out. And that does look like graffiti and that is shameful. So the mayor of Thessaloniki, get someone down here to clean that up. But aside from, from that, this is an awesome, awesome statue of Aristotle who was also the teacher of Alexander the Great. And of course, some people think he is the greatest Greek philosopher, but um, this is his square. And uh, this video is coming to an end. <laughs> Take care everybody from Thessaloniki, Greece.